They can run, but are they fast enough? Ollie Williams is on pest control duty out after squirrels. I mean, I was trying to be cool, but it didn't work. <laughs> it's all about the girth, don't you know? Paul Childerly explains how to assess and measure muntjac heads. In general, you'll find good body, good quality animal, will produce good antlers. Plus, the bird table of doom returns, but with Field Sports Channel member and shareholder Nigel Appleton, who, inspired by David's filmmaking workshop and my pest control efforts, has created his own BTOD. We think he does rather well. We have news, we have hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. It was never going to be just about squirrels. So what I have here is, um, as you can see, it's, it's uh, basically vermin I've shot over the last few days. Um, really the smelly the better, so the foxes can smell it. Magpies this time of year is obviously very important with the younger birds all nesting and they really are very destructive. Um, so yeah, once you've got your vermin, just put a couple of carcasses on the end of a string and then run the string up to part of the house, which basically you're in. So for example, it's my bedroom. Um, at the end of the string, I've got a bell. At the end of that, obviously, when something grabs hold of this, that bell then goes off. The alarming anyone who's in there at the moment, so possibly Laura. Anyway, so that bell then goes off and hopefully wakes you up or alerts you, whatever you're doing. Um, and you know there's probably a fox at the end of the uh, either the house cat, which um, is always a bit annoying, but normally a fox at the end of the line. And uh, if you've got a gun to hand, you know exactly where to look with a lamp. So um, it's a easy, good and easy way to control predators around the home. So last night at about 4 a.m. I was woken to a very loud crash. Uh, and it did, the bell sort of woke me up. And as I went to, to sort of look, to look out the window with the lamp, um, it then the fox then pulled hard again and it broke the bell off the, rack, the bracket and smashed the window. <laughs> so I think the Charlie had the last laugh in that situation. But um, yeah, it was, I think there's a bit of design fault which has been amended. Um, and it's now back in action, so all good. We are out squirrelling. Ollie's family land holding supports the reintroduction of Cornish red squirrels, and that means straight up get rid of the greys. There are a few questions we answer over and over again in comments, and so for the record, grey squirrels are non native invaders that eat songbird eggs and chicks that kill trees and that carry a disease that kills the UK's native red squirrels. And no, we generally don't eat them in the UK, though Southern Fried Squirrel was Elvis Presley's favourite dish. All hail the king. The first one Ollie comes across is at the edge of the shotgun's range and beyond the camera. A bit ambitious, but have a pot, why not? Needs to be, needs to be shot, so wasn't going to let us any closer, certainly. The problem is today we've got uh, a very an alien invasion which is obviously the grey squirrel across the whole country um, and we down here there's a red, the red squirrel trust down here is there's a very fervent drive towards eradicating the greys or as diminishing their numbers as, as much as possible if not eradicating them um, through a reintroduction program for the for the reds uh, so far the pairs that have been released uh, at Trewithin in places like that haven't done very well because there's just too many greys around I mean you'll see today we'll be walking through the, the, the woods and well cameras out so we'll probably see none <laughs> but we'd hope to see a few and hopefully shoot a few and we can't shoot enough really because they're just causing causing chaos with 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 them um, well there's no reds around here at all anymore as a result so a walk around like this gives ollie a chance to be a can of heineken and reach the parts of the farm that other estate workers don't reach here's a pond he's been working on it was very very enclosed very overgrown about a year ago um, and i've spent a lot of time down here with the chainsaw as you can see um, just clearing it out, trying to get a bit of light into the area, trying to get these pond weeds growing up and um, just creating a bit of a habitat for, for waterfowl. Really as a flighting pond was, was sort of the first uh, port of call, but I realised last summer that it was having a really great effect on the wildlife as a whole. This wood is very good for, for deer, um, very good for you know ground nesting birds. So it's just a very, because it's very private, very sort of off the beaten track. A big part of shooting for me is, is just, it's just a, it's a walk around. It's, it's seeing your hard work of, of basically trying to help mother nature out pay off you know you see that you see the wild birds coming out um, you shoot one or two but most importantly you have a good day out and i think that's what we're trying to achieve with the, with the wild birds these this year is just trying to create a habitat and you know, really keep the predators down 
um, you know, foxes obviously, magpies, um, uh, jays, you know, the corvids, really trying to control them to an extent where they're not raiding the nest. You know, I saw a, what's it called, an Instagram post by um, Paul Childley today actually. And he was just, he just put up a post with a bunch of feathers and a clutch of eggs. And obviously a fox had come in there and just, just, just grabbed the hen because she won't obviously, she won't leave the nest um, until, until it's too late. So if you can try and get rid of the predators and create these habitats, then, you know, you're giving, it, you're giving them the fighting chance of producing at least some, of some, some young, so. Back to the squirrels and Ollie heads up to woodland where there is a row of pheasant feeders or, as the squirrels call them, squirrel feeders. <laughs> Basically what we've got here, as you can see, also the pheasant feeders and the squirrels, they, they also cause a lot of damage to this. All this damage here, you can see, this handle's basically about to come off. Um, this has all been gnawed down. They actually eventually gnaw through this uh, and create holes in it. Which, and these lids, and very annoyingly, are very hard to come by. So um, it's either a box job sort of get it all back together, but most of the time it's replacing the entire feeder um, for a little hole. Another corner, another feeder, another squirrel. I mean, I was trying to be cool, but it didn't work. <laughs> After the excitement, we hear the peeping of a row kid that's lost its mother. It's calling plaintively from beside the pheasant pen. There's nothing you can or should do to help nature here, but for our own peace of mind, we hide under a tree to see what happens. Sure enough, she comes and claims the kid as soon as she thinks we're out of the way. Probably could have had one or two more, but... Uh... Um, yeah, to happy with three. It's, um, it's just thinning them out. Like I said, it's, it sort of feel, fills into what I was saying earlier. It's a difficult thing to really eradicate the squirrels because they're they're quite quick and they're very. Um, when you've got the really thick woodlands like this, it's, it's really hard to get in on them. But uh, yeah, three nice off, nice sort of evenings work. I have eaten squirrel before, but I, I wouldn't really recommend it. You know, it's quite stringy. There are two red squirrel projects underway in Cornwall. The Red Squirrel Survival Trust, patron His Royal Highness the Duke of Cornwall, is a captive breeding project with a centre at nearby Trewithin. The Cornwall Red Squirrel Project is all about removing greys from the Lizard Peninsula and then moving the project east, ultimately as far as Kent. Both are keen to see greys shot. Links are in the description below. Good shooting, Ollie. And fascinating to see that row kid making that meep meep noise. Now for another defenseless animal trapped up against wire, it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. The Scottish Government that condemns foreign hunters arriving in the country and stalking stags has earned half a million pounds from trophy hunting. Hunters paid £587,000 to Forestry and Land Scotland for permits to shoot around 10,000 deer over the last five years. Nationalist leader Nicola Sturgeon previously complained about foreigners coming to Scotland to shoot deer and vowed to stop them. According to the Scottish Mail on Sunday, the FLS culls around 100,000 deer a year, meaning it could potentially earn £5 million annually from selling permits. A spokesman for the body says that recreational deer management can help achieve important biodiversity objectives and bring in revenue for the local economy. One of the UK's premier gamekeeping colleges is to shut. Ascombe Bryan College is proposing to close its Newton Rigg campus in Cumbria at the end of the next academic year in summer 2021. It is the only college with its own grouse moor. The Newton Rigg Gamekeeping Department released a statement saying it understands what concern the news will generate among young applicants, progressing students and supporters. The closure of the facility near Penrith will see 117 job losses and be a hammer blow for the region, says the University and College Union. It vows to fight the closure. A vegan extremist website is back online after the police shut it down last week. The cops were investigating vandalism of a Nottingham butcher, which was spray painted, had its window smashed and locks glued. The vandalism was celebrated in posts on the website and social media accounts of Unoffensive Animal, which describes itself as an anarcho-vegan collective. 
following the post the website shut down, but it's now up and running again on a server in Iceland. A golf course in North London has scrapped its Fox Pest Control after online and offline pressure. Sabs bombarded Muswell Hill Golf Club's social media sites accusing people at the club of offering them cocaine while families were there and complaining it isn't at market enough. But they also asked followers to phone the club to complain. The club issued a statement saying it will stop killing foxes. It described the harassment as forceful to Field Sports News and said it was concerned about the volume of social media and emails, saying some of it was obscene. It says there was damage caused and it was a matter of managing the damage. The club says it decided Haringey's Council's Fox management policy is wrong because some people object to it and will put different practices in place. Two men who stole a shotgun from a Nottinghamshire gun club have been jailed. Scrutiny of security camera images led to the prosecution of Ricky Lount on the left and Lee Wilburn, both 30 and from Doncaster. They will spend a combined 43 months in prison. Police were called to Austin Shooting Club on the 24th of November 2019 after a report a shotgun was stolen from a gun rack. On the 1st of December, Lount returned and stole a pickup truck from the car park. The owner's Doberman was in the back. The club issued an appeal for the dog on Facebook and it was returned the next day. Lount was spotted on security cameras in Mount Pleasant Kennels handing it over. The pair went back a third time on the 19th of December, but members saw them and called the police, who arrested them a day later. Farmers in Ireland are getting a bonus for saving hen harriers. They will share 450,000 euros following a successful breeding season. Last year, 56 pairs produced 81 chicks in participating special protection areas. A pair in County Kerry hatched five chicks. The Hen Harrier program says hatchlings have increased more than a third since 2017. There are 157 of the birds in Ireland where driven grouse shooting hardly takes place. Meanwhile, in the UK, where there are more than 600 breeding pairs, Natural England says it has renewed a hen harrier brood management trial licence. This involves taking hen harrier eggs or chicks and raising them in captivity before release. Last year was a record year for hen harrier breeding success in England. A new book has gained publicity for publishing a small list of safari hunting companies. Trophy Hunters Exposed by Eduardo Gonzalez of the UK-based campaign against trophy hunting makes it clear cyberbullying is fine as long as your victim is a hunting tourist. It is a directory of UK hunting tourism companies copied and pasted from the directories of game fairs and hunting shows, with statements designed to incite death threats against hunters. Among hunting safari operations, Gonzalez victimises Nanduna hunting safaris, Blackthorn Safari and their UK agents. The British government is pumping funds into fighting wildlife smuggling. The Illegal Wildlife Trade Challenge Fund is getting £3.4 million for projects to protect endangered species, including pangolins, elephants and chimpanzees along the Nigeria-Cameroon border and jaguars in Bolivia. The government says illegal trading in wildlife is a criminal industry worth more than £17 billion each year and is pushing some species to the brink of extinction. So far, the fund has supported 85 projects worth more than £26 million. A highly contagious rabbit-killing virus is racing across America. Rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus, RHDV type 2, is threatening hundreds of millions of wild rabbits, hares and pikers, as well as millions of pets in the US. Owners have been advised to isolate their animals. RHDV was first detected in China before spreading to Europe and Australia, according to the Times. One estimate suggests it has killed 90% of wild rabbits in the UK. The US National Wildlife Health Center says rabbits, their pelts and meat and anything they've come into contact with, like insects, food bowls and bedding, can spread it. A gun advocacy group has emerged as the loudest voice against Canada's weapon ban. The Canadian Coalition for Firearm Rights has recruited dozens of hunting, fishing, wildlife and gun groups to oppose Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's ban on more than a thousand semi-automatic rifles and 453 other weapons. They're calling on the Trudeau government to repeal its 1st of May order, saying they represent millions of members from all over Canada. A statement says that the ban circumvents democracy because lawmakers did not vote on it in Parliament and there was no voice for Canadians. Thanks to Per Holmseth for the story. And finally, golfers itching to get back out onto the greens have discovered that wildlife has moved in in their absence. In South Carolina, these two alligators chose a fairway to fight it out. 
Hilton Head Lakes Golf Course in South Carolina described the tussle as a sudden death playoff on the 18th and said it lasted two hours. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stocking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. Later in the show, Paul talks about Munties. First up, here's a little bit about Pulsar. Good stuff. Now, Paul Childerly is measuring Munchak heads. Here's how he does it. So, the Munchak. Munchak obviously have antlers and uh, the canine tooth as well. They use both for, for basically fighting other bucks and protection as well. You, you generally find Munchak um, can be quite aggressive. Um, get an old dog of a buck, he will um, fight back against a dog. A local park, I was called in to go and sort some muntjac out because actually people were walking a dog through there and uh, they were getting ripped up by, uh, by muntjac. They thought it was Chinese water to start with but it 100% wasn't, it was, it was basically an old muntjac that had been dogged enough times and he uh, did a bit of payback. So basically muntjac are measured on the antlers only. Um, you can see with these two here, the age, yeah, a juvenile muntjac have very long peticles. These are peticles here. And you see the older, older mature buck, very short. So as they get, up, get older, they, they basically shorten, thicken and shorten. Also these ridges here do get protruded out from the skull. Muntjac are, again, just measurement, um, not like the roe deer. Roe deer are done um, with the weighing as well. So basically it's a dry weight and a wet weight um, with the roe deer. But on Muntjac it's just actually measurement of the uh, antlers. Width, length of the antler, circumference halfway up the antler, circumference of the coronet, length of the brow tine, add them all together, take off the minuses from each so they basically make sure they're symmetrical. Um, so you see this one here is longer than this one, so basically it would actually measure off this one, as you can see. Um, put them all together and you get a, uh, a figure at the end and then they get measured from there as bronze, silver and gold. To get a buck, buck that will score is actually quite hard. Um, you get a lot of places where there's a high density of muntjac, the antlers won't be quite as good because obviously the food source and probably again you're getting young bucks like this breeding and you know this buck here has got a, a, a male form on the end here um, but you get you know that breeding through it won't be a good animal stock whereas this one you know this is a good strong buck um, it's not that long but I would, personally I would say this buck is starting to, to go back probably last year it would have been a little bit longer um, probably up here somewhere they must be harder to manage than the Chinese, though, mustn't they? Well, totally, because they're so secretive. They're, they're a secretive animal, um, but normally when we start feeding the pheasants, we start seeing the bucks show up. So, you know, you can start like, seeing that's a good buck, we'll leave that one for another couple of years, let him breed, and then, you know, take out some young ones. Do the antlers represent the quality of the buck as well, as in the body size and the meat? Um, it's quite a funny one. You get this with rodeo occasionally as well. You sometimes get a, a, a smaller bodied animal will put all its, its testosterone and energy into a massive set of antlers. Um, but in general, you'll find good body, good quality animal will produce good antlers um, in all of them. Um, so it is back to genetics, food. Um, so yeah, managing the stock, again, it is important. Um, right back from does and bucks. So why are the teeth ignored? Are they just too insignificant? Um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're small, these, these are two here. A lot of the time on the mature bucks, they're normally broken. See this one here, he's, he's chipped, because they do use them a lot, they use them for digging, um, fighting. I mean, if you see, a lot of people haven't witnessed muntjac fighting. They are so, so, so aggressive. Um, I had one the other day, actually, um, in the middle of the field, absolutely smashing a, a, a younger buck, but he was still a good buck. But he was, you know, knocking him over, and, and he, they were squealing. You know, you sometimes get them with serious cuts up through the neck, all up through the face, 
up through the flanks. So yeah, they are quite aggressive, aggressive deer really. Um, so the tusks are just, just purely for, for fighting. A totally different animal to the Chinese. A different, different hunt, isn't it? Oh, totally different hunt. Yeah, that's, that's unique when you hunt, hunt both together. Um, Chinese are in the open field, you've got plenty of time, you can assess the animal, make sure it's, it's exactly what you want to shoot. Uh, Muntjac, you've got to do that in 10 seconds. See it, identify, yes or no, a split second, and it's over. Um, but we can call these guys. You can't call Munt, uh, Chinese water deer, but you can call Muntjac. Some people say you're trying to uh, mimic the, the fawn, but it's, it's, there's, there's several different ways really basically. You're mimicking a fawn to pull the female, she'll come out and protect it and you might drag a, drag a, a buck in behind her that's um, chasing her or following her. Other times people don't realise that the patella, when it's quite aggressive and loud, if you've seen these bucks fight, it's very similar to the, to the sound of that, it's like the, the heavy squeak, it's buck in distress and in pain and you'll get a buck that's dominant in an area will come and look and he'll come and look, he'll, he'll be crafty, he'll come and stick his head around the corner I mean, we won't generally charge in unless it's a younger buck, but they will come and look, and that's, that's generally what I find. It's the, uh, the distress call more than um, a juvenile. So yeah, it's, quite, it's a very interesting species to hunt, very exciting, um, because you're calling them in, and it's very close quarter hunting, so it's very personal, so it's great. Thank you, Paul. Now, as gun shops look to open next week, here is the last of our lockdown series of Bargain Hunter. It is indeed our helping hand for the British gun trade, four UK-based websites offering four great lockdown deals. Until the end of this month only, Timber Build Dog Kennels, which, as you may guess, manufactures, designs and assembles dog kennels, is offering 10% off its entire kennel range. Go to timberbuilddogkennels.co.uk and quote FSTV10 to take advantage of this exclusive and truly wonderful offer. Night Vision Specialist Scott Country has taken delivery of the new Series 2 Accolade LRF and Pulsar Helion 2 in the XP50 range. They are now for sale at £500 and £600 less, respectively, than the previous XP50 models. Snap them up at scottcountry.co.uk. Perkins Guns, located out in the Northamptonshire countryside, is open for contactless payment and collection Tuesday to Saturday, 8.30am to 5pm. You can see its range of second-hand guns at perkinsguns.co.uk. And coming out of lockdown and still have heads to clean and whiten, contact LH Skull Cleaning, which offers that for almost all quarry at prices starting at just £20 plus postage and packing. They also dry and tan hides and make brush key rings. Contact Lorcan by email lhskullcleaning at gmail.com. And you can see all the links for these deals written down and eminently clickable at fchannel slash bargain hunter. Thanks to all of you who spent on retail in the last few months, those gun shops really needed you. Now inspired by my own Bird Table of Doom film, but of course instructed by David's film school course last year, viewer Nigel Appleton filmed, scripted, voiced and edited this. Occasionally, we all need a little encouragement to get on with those things that we've left undone for far too long. Charlie's feature on the Bird Table of Doom reminded me that for some time I'd been concerned that I was feeding far more than the ten spoilt chickens in my small domestic coop. I wasn't so much fussed about the plethora of little songbirds nor the brace of pheasants from the nearby game shoot that appeared to have set up residence in my garden. What did bother me, particularly with so many songbirds nesting, was the constant stream of rooks, crows, jackdaws, squirrels and all their kin. Shooting through the fine mesh of a chicken coop is not recommended as your shot is likely to be deflected, at best resulting in a miss and at worst a wounded quarry. So, dredging up some long forgotten military training, the first step was to modify the battle space and channel my enemy into a killing zone of my choosing by setting up some old bird feeders. My weapon of choice was my trusty Viral HW100, which, unlike Charlie's, 
did have some air in the cylinder. All that remained to be done was to check zero, so you can imagine my delight when this chap popped out of the dustbin. Covid-19 anybody? All preparations made, it was particularly frustrating when the first visitor to my killing zone was immune from prosecution. But it wasn't too long before the first squirrel turned up. As the saying goes, off the mark, to be followed quite some time later, I must admit, by the first jackdaw. With the sun setting, another squirrel made the fatal mistake of popping in for a bite to eat. Not all visitors were unwelcome, though this pair didn't seem to be very keen to see each other. Walking back to my hide the following day, I came across this poor little chap. Clearly he'd been predated from a nearby nest, perhaps by one of these. My wife asked me if my efforts had been worthwhile, and certainly I'm very glad to have got rid of some predators from my local area. But as the bird food I use to attract them costs three times as much as the chicken food, I think I might just let them continue to rob the chickens. Squirrel! Well done, Nigel. And he's not the only one to pick up the Bird Table of Doom baton and run with it. Viewer Steve Kearney's father, Desi, picked off these rats over a couple of nights with his air gun. It is, as Steve says, the joys of lockdown. And viewer Ian Forster has a real problem, as this video shows. He's been trapping them, but intends to come up with a new plan of action. Ian is in Northumberland and shoots grey squirrels there as part of a red squirrel group. Now, you may have spotted I've been putting out a Friday chat show to keep you awake or to help you to sleep over the weekend, depending on how you look at it. Last week, it was the turn of the new chief executive of the British Game Alliance. Here's a clip. As a shooting community, I really wouldn't get too concerned about this idea that, oh, look, there are six organisations signing a letter, not five. Because, you know, having just come out of, of government, you look, at, you look at the roster of organisations that turn up to represent the conservation movement. It is massive. And you might think, oh, well, what a waste of money. You know, why haven't they only got one? Well, fine. But every one of those organisations gets a seat at the table. And it, it, it's a bit of a nonsense, this idea that oh, it would be better if we only had one, because then you get one seat at the table. Um, you know, it, it's no bad thing to have different aspects of what we do amplified and taken care of by a dedicated team of individuals. I, I, I personally don't think that's a problem. Thank you, Liam. And you can watch the whole of that if you click on the link on the screen or in the description below. Uh, this Friday's chat show is going to be almost all of the Basque Council election candidates talking about where shooting is, where Basque is. They'll be touching on lead, on trophy hunting, the future of gamekeeping and whether they should be merging Basque with the Countryside Alliance. Look out for that on Friday. And now, from what may turn out to be a load of old hot air, to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, it is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. This is highly watchable. George Sanders talks to you, the viewer, and to his Jack Russell fudge as he tries to nail a single rat in a cow buyer. The South Somerset ferreters are on a night vision rabbit shooting extravaganza. Jeff Jefferson has his night sight out and enters nine-month-old copper to rabbits. A touch of drama opens Munchak stalking in Suffolk by Simon Whitehead. The film takes you behind the scenes of a Suffolk deer manager's work producing lovely venison. 
A couple of catty classics next. The Catapult Channel is on a simulation target course around the Gloucester Spartans range with Tom Calladine and John Sturgeon. Meanwhile, Wayne Martin stakes out a garden and a horse paddock that rabbits are hitting hard. Bonus is the local resident Squirrel, as it turns out Squirrel is first up for the Catty Shack treatment. DJ Decoys is back, shooting Pinkfoots over grass using Enforcer Windsocks, set out randomly at a range of 35 to 45 yards. Ultimate Safaris in Namibia produces this real-life conservation travel series showing what it's like and how tough it is for animals when there is no hunting going on. This is the first of several episodes. And finally, former All Black Piriwipu, I hope I said that right, is fellow stalking and fishing in a lovely half-hour episode that shows how to enjoy these great outdoor sports in Maori and English and lose nothing in translation. That's it for this week. I've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the I symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email me the link charlie at fields sportschannel.tv Well, that's it for this week. If you haven't done so, please whip over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. There's a link in the description below. You can catch up on news on the front page there. You can click to like us on Instagram and on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube, and of course, pop your email address into our register page, and we'll contact you about this show, Field Sports Britain. It's at 7 p.m. UK time every Wednesday. Plus, you can back us. Follow the links to the Field Sports Nation to find out how to join our merry band of 500 people and the perks that come with that. I'll see you next week. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing, and goodbye. Goodbye.